Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, for giving up a Saturday afternoon to come listen to this information. I think I'll give you some great, great information, and you'll be glad you participated, whether you're here in person or watching online. Particular thanks to the Hippocrates Health Institute and the other sponsors who have made this terrific conference possible, and to Steve Shore for conceiving and organizing this wonderful event. Let's give Hippocrates Health Institute and Steve Shore a big hand. A few years ago, I sent an email to a bunch of friends with a link in it to a factory farming video. And I asked them to watch the video and tell me what they thought of it. And I got a wide range of responses, everything from sort of incredulity to um, uh, denial and everything in between. But the response that really stuck out was from the dean of a law school who wrote back and said, the behavior in the video that he saw was deplorable and despicable, but in his view, it was illegal. And that meant that it was an exception or an anomaly. It didn't rise to the level of a systemic problem that he or anyone else needed to concern ourselves with. I didn't actually know whether that was true or not several years ago, but I looked into it, and what I found out really shocked me. And that is that in the last three to four decades, animal food producers in this country have embarked on an aggressive legislative campaign to emasculate the anti-cruelty protections that once protected farm animals from abuse. That is not all. They have also made it difficult or impossible for consumers in many states to investigate criticize, or sue them. These legal protections exist like a cocoon surrounding producers and protecting them from the effects of their activity and allowing them, importantly, to offload a significant portion of their costs on a society. By offloading costs, they can lower the retail prices they charge consumers, they can sell more goods, and they can make more money. So these laws have important economic benefits for the producers that lobby so hard to get them passed. Accordingly, one of the themes in my book and one of the main themes of this talk is this. We're used to thinking about factory farms as having these three problems, ethical, nutritional, and environmental. I think we need to start thinking about factory farms as having problems in this fourth category, and that is economic problems. Another theme that I'll discuss uh, in this talk, and that is uh, a major theme of the book, stems from this somewhat obscure 80s record album. And I like this image because the title of the album is Freedom of Choice, but as you can see, the band members are not actually, either they think they're exercising freedom of choice and they're not, or they're simply not. In any event, the reason I think this is significant is Animal food producers in this country have been very successful in diminishing the ability of consumers to make informed and independent decisions about what to eat. Consumers think we have freedom of choice, and we think that we make our own independent decisions when we go to the grocery store to buy food, but in fact, what is really going on is much more complicated. And we'll look at some of that in this presentation. What I would like to talk about in the next hour, 15 or 20 minutes, is four things. First, I look at some of the ways that animal food producers are so successful at manipulating and controlling consumer behavior. Second, I'll look at some of the economic consequences that result from that producer behavior. Third, I'll look at the question whether this market and this system is sustainable in the long term. And finally, I'll propose a couple of solutions to the problems that Meatonomics presents. So let's start with one of the ways that producers control consumer behavior. In 1932, Aldous Huxley published this book, A Brave New World. And like the Devo album, the title is ironic because the world that Huxley envisioned for our future was not really a brave new one. It was a creepy, 
dark, and dystopian one. It's a future in which the government exists for only one purpose, and that's to get consumers to buy more goods. In the Huxleyan future, the government accomplishes its purpose through a couple of ways, the most important of which is that it repeatedly bombards consumers with messages to get them to buy things that they don't necessarily want or need. So, for example, because it's better for the economy for you to buy a new shirt rather than sew up an old shirt that has a rip, these messages say things like, ending is better than mending, or the more stitches, the less riches. I suggest that we are living in a version of this Huxleyan future today. Here's why. Our government, the United States federal government, is engaged in a messaging campaign, and they are bombarding us as consumers with messages to get us to buy more animal foods. We have grown up with these. Depending on how old you are, you may have spent your entire life hearing, reading, seeing these messages. There are things like beef, it's what's for dinner, milk, it does a body good, pork, the other white meat, milk life, pork be inspired, the incredible edible egg. These messages emanate from what are called checkoff programs, just like check a box. The name of the program stems from a time past when they were voluntary. They're no longer voluntary, they're mandatory. And because most people never even heard of these programs, and yet they are incredibly important, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes telling you how they work and why they're so shocking. Checkoff programs exist to promote a number of animal foods, beef, pork, dairy, eggs, and both fluid and non-fluid milk and lamb. The only thing they don't really cover is chicken. They're created by Congress, and they exist as a statute. And what they say is that the first wholesale buyer of a good must collect and remit a small assessment. They use the word assessment, but it's actually a tax. Any mandatory payment you're required to make that's imposed by government is a tax. So, for example, when a slaughterhouse buys cattle from a rancher, it collects $1 per head, and it sends the money to a central organization that collects the funds. The funds are used for two purposes, promotion and research. Now, a couple of salient features of checkoff programs that I must inform you of. First of all, industry likes to say that this is a private commercial endeavor. They say, we, industry, we collect these funds, we pay them to this organization, we oversee how they're spent, and therefore, the implication is, leave us alone. This is just like when McDonald's advertises Big Macs. This is capitalism, it's private. That is actually completely false. In 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court decided an important decision called Johans versus Livestock Marketing. In that case, the court looked at the involvement of the United States Department of Agriculture, or the USDA, in checkoff programs, and it found the USDA is involved in appointing the leadership of the programs, overseeing the collection of funds, overseeing the spending of funds, overseeing editing and vetoing the messages that come out of checkoff programs. Accordingly, the court held when a checkoff program speaks, it speaks the message of the federal government. It speaks what's called government speech. The United States Supreme Court, the highest court in our land, says, when you hear that message, beef, it's what's for dinner, that is the federal government telling you to eat more beef. This is not a matter of controversy or debate. This is a settled principle of law that has been decided and can no longer be appealed. So, first of all, that's pretty Huxleyan, isn't it? The federal government is saying, beef, it's what's for dinner. The other salient feature of these programs is that the industry likes to say, we're paying the tax. And as I said, 
Nominally, at least, it is the first wholesale buyer of a good, that's an industry participant, who collects that tax and pays it. However, the research shows that, in that example, that one dollar per head of cattle, that is passed on to consumers in the form of higher retail prices. So an economist would say, the consumer bears the incidence of that tax. So again, the industry has got it wrong. Now, I said that these programs engage in a couple of things, promotion and research. The promotion, that's the stuff like the messages, beef, it's what's for dinner. The research um, is perhaps even more troubling. And I want to talk about one of the studies that illustrates what industry-sponsored research looks like. But before I do, I want to take you through a little thought experiment. Let's say you were hired by the tobacco industry to design a study that shows that cigar smoking does not cause lung cancer. Could you do that? Well, if you design the study carefully, you could. Here's one way you might do it. Take two study groups or cohorts. Make sure that they both smoke a lot. Let's say three packs of cigarettes a day. Give one cohort a cigar a day. Don't give this cohort any cigars. Now, first of all, these two cohorts, because they smoke three packs of cigarettes a day, their risk of developing lung cancer is significantly higher than that of the general population, right? Let's say it's two or three times higher. We don't know, this is just a thought experiment. But when this other group gets a cigar a day, it might not materially increase their risk for lung cancer. Why? Because it was already huge, right? And you could conclude that a cigar a day does not increase your risk of lung cancer. And if a tobacco industry ever wants, me to hire, ever wants to hire me, I'll design the study for them. Now, let's look at an example of how this is done in, in animal foods. This is something called the Qureshi Egg Study, Q-U-R-E-S-H-I. In this study, they took two cohorts, or study groups for comparison, the characteristics of these study groups are relevant. The mean body mass index of each group was 26, which places it over the threshold for overweight, which is 25. So both groups are overweight. And the mean blood cholesterol level was 220 milligrams per deciliter. And as you may know, the accepted clinical safe level is 200. So they're 10% over the sort of medical standard, and they're more like 50% over the average blood cholesterol for those on a plant-based diet, which is closer to 150. So, two cohorts who are overweight and have high cholesterol. The study sets out to ask the question, or to answer the question, if we feed one of these cohorts an egg a day, will it increase their risk of heart disease? And guess what? Because these cohorts already had a risk for heart disease that was significantly elevated, particularly in comparison to, for example, somebody on a plant-based diet, when they fed one of the cohorts an egg a day, it didn't materially increase their risk of heart disease. It's actually not that surprising. It's not unlike the cigar study that I, that I suggested. When a better design study was done in Japan, it compared two cohorts who ate very small amounts of animal foods and were generally healthy. Those cohorts got, one of them got no eggs, and one of them got an egg a day. And guess what? The egg a day cohort had a significantly higher risk of mortality than the other cohort. This kind of research is misleading and dangerous. At the time that I was writing my book, the um, egg board, the US egg board, had posted on its website a celebration about this study, which said, an egg a day is more than okay. And who's to know how many people have, have <laughs> continued to eat eggs or have increased the number of eggs that they've eaten based on this completely misleading and, and very carefully designed study. The research shows that when industry sponsors a research study, it's four times more likely than otherwise to reach a conclusion that is favorable to industry. And just as you'd expect, the research that these checkoff programs fund produces tons and tons of studies that, that show us animal foods are not bad for us.
However, for anyone who's been at this conference for the last 10 days, you've heard from many doctors, dietitians, and other clinicians who say the opposite. So, I encourage you to exercise discretion when thinking about these studies. Checkoff programs might not seem so dangerous or creepy if they weren't so incredibly effective. However, they really are effective. This slide contains data that the checkoff programs themselves release. And this shows that in a typical recent year, these programs spent about $550 million, and the extra sales that resulted in the bottom right corner was about $4.6 billion. It's about an average 8 to 1 return on investment. Any business person would be thrilled to get that kind of return on their marketing dollars. Now, you might say, that's a good thing. The economy is recovering from a recession. This means increased spending, and stimulus, and job creation, and those are all things that we want. As we'll see in, in some of the ensuing slides, I, these extra sales of animal foods are not good for our economy. They're bad for our economy, and we'll see why. Here's another problem with checkoff programs. Americans don't actually need to be told to buy more animal foods because in virtually every age and sex demographic, people already consume more than the USDA says they should. All the data on this slide comes directly from the USDA, both the recommendations and the actual consumption data. And what it shows is that, for example, in the, in the group of males 30 to 39, they're consuming two-thirds again as much meat, eggs, and seafood, as the USDA says they should. So why is the government telling them to eat even more by, by saying, beef, it's what's for dinner? It doesn't make any sense. It's Huxleyan. For those who came in late, Huxleyan refers to the, the book Brave New World, in which the government tries to get people to buy things they don't want or need. I don't think Americans want or need animal foods in any quantity let alone in these absurd quantities at which we're consuming them today. One in three Americans is obese. Two in three Americans is overweight. One in three Americans has heart disease. That's an, that's an astonishing statistic. When you include hypertension or high blood pressure, one in three Americans today has heart disease. We have just about doubled our consumption of animal foods in the last 80 years. We've gone from about 100 pounds per person in 1935 to just under 200 pounds per person today. Depending on which list, which ranking you look at, the United States either is number one, two, or three in the world in terms of per capita meat consumption. We eat, on average, three times as much per capita as the rest of the world. We also have, on average, three times the rate of cancer as the rest of the world. We're a nation of sick and overweight people, and it's largely the result of what we eat. Not just animal foods, we also eat a lot of processed foods and sugary foods, but the clinical literature establishes beyond doubt animal foods are contributing to these problems. Our government should not be behind efforts to get us to eat more of them. It just doesn't make any sense. Let's talk about another way that producers influence behavior. And that's through this legislative agenda that I spoke about at the beginning. In the mid-1970s, this organization, the American Legislative Exchange Council, was formed, ALEC. ALEC is an incubator for legislation. It serves to bring together corporate lobbyists who pay high dues to participate and business-friendly state legislators. They come together and they meet around fun events like dinners and rafting trips and trips to Disney World or Disneyland, show tickets. And when they're done, they have typically conceived, they've incubated legislation that the, that the legislators can take back to their home states and introduce as laws to get passed. In a typical year, ALEC is responsible for about a thousand bills being introduced in state legislatures around the country. Each year, about 200 of those pass as law. So, in the last 40 years that it's been in existence, thousands of 
New laws have been passed as a result of this organization's efforts. What kind of laws are we talking about? Well, for example, they're behind the voter identification laws in 34 states that have been found to unfairly target racial minorities, some of which are being challenged today um, in court. They're also behind a spate of laws that protect animal food producers. And I'd like to talk about some of these. Starting at the lower left, ag gag laws. Most people have heard about these because they're in the news a lot. These are laws that make it illegal to engage in an undercover investigation at a factory farm. So, that video that I talked about at the beginning of my talk that I sent to people and asked them to watch and, and provide feedback on, the, the making of that video is illegal in eight states now. Now, Fortunately, these laws are increasingly on the radar of the public and the legislators and the, and the governors, um, thankfully, who are asked to take action on them. One of these laws just passed the legislature in North Carolina, which is a leading pork-producing state, and it was just vetoed by that state's governor, thankfully. Yeah, you can applaud that. Yeah. And I, and I hope that increasingly we'll see these laws get defeated. Unfortunately, there's always somebody in the legislature who will introduce them. So next year, there will be another bill introduced in North Carolina, and, and the year after that, and the year after that. And if the governor changes, that may get signed into law. Food defamation laws. These are laws that say, if you defame a food product, you can be held civilly liable. What does it mean to defame a food product? It means two things. To say something that is damaging and untrue about food. So, for example, in Texas, where they have such a law, if you were to take a trip to Texas and post on your Facebook page, all of the dairy coming out of Texas is contaminated with a toxin. If the dairy industry sees its sales decline, and what you said is not true, you can be liable for food defamation under that state's defamation law. Oprah Winfrey learned about this law the hard way a few years back. She had, as a guest on her show, Howard Lyman, who is a retired uh, former cattle rancher who is now vegan and advocates for veganism uh, and plant-based diets and, and animals. They were talking about the Texas beef industry, and at one point, Oprah threw up her hands and said, you stopped me cold, I'll never eat another burger. Because of some of the facts that we're talking about, that they were talking about, and her statement, the Texas Cattlemen's Beef Association brought a lawsuit under the Texas food defamation law against uh, Oprah and Howard. Now, what they were saying was completely true. So they had a legitimate defense to that lawsuit, and ultimately, they prevailed by showing that what they were saying was true. But it's expensive to litigate a case like that, especially where, where facts are at issue and you're trying to establish the truth of facts. They spent an estimated $1 million defending themselves in that lawsuit. So you can see that these laws have the potential to chill free speech. If, if Oprah had her show today, I doubt she would want to entangle with the Texas Beef Cattlemen's Association again. I wouldn't. Who wants to get sued and spend a million dollars? Even if what you know you say is true, anybody can sue anybody in this country, and you've got to extricate yourself. So these laws, I, I think, have the, have the potential to chill free speech in this country. Cheeseburger laws that we now have in half of the states in this country, these are based on a model ALEC statute called the Common Sense Consumption Act. These laws say that a plaintiff cannot recover from a manufacturer, distributor, or retailer of food based on the theory that food caused the plaintiff to become obese or develop an obesity-related disease. The proponents of these laws have been very straightforward in saying that these laws are designed to prevent the kinds of large damages awards and settlements that the tobacco industry has been subjected to in the last several decades. As you may know, the tobacco industry in this country has paid over $400 billion to settle lawsuits brought by state Medicaid programs. Now, those lawsuits generally arose because the, the tobacco industry concealed information that showed that cigarettes 
smoking uh, and, uh, and the use of other tobacco products was bad for our health. Unfortunately, if and when the information begins to emerge in the next decade or two, as I expect that it will, to show that animal foods, uh, not only are animal foods bad for our health, but that the industry has been misleading us about their effect on our health, in half of the states in this country, we will not be able to bring lawsuits based on um, these cheeseburger laws that will block, block that litigation. I'm going to skip over customary farming exemptions and come back to it and talk about animal and ecological terrorism laws. We have these in four out of five states in this country. These laws provide that what would otherwise be a relatively innocuous crime, like trespass, theft, malicious mischief, vandalism, if the crime is directed at an animal enterprise, which includes anything involving animals, a factory farm, a restaurant, a grocery store, a zoo, an aquarium, a testing facility, if that innocuous crime is directed at an animal enterprise, the penalties are significantly higher than otherwise. The, the putative purpose of these laws, as expressed by the people who, who pushed to get them passed, is that we need to protect the safety of the American food system. When I was researching the book, I was really interested in learning about food terrorism cases in this country. And it turns out that we haven't really had any. The FBI has never had a food terrorism case on its list of major terrorism cases. The only two food terrorism cases I've found were tiny, they were local, and nobody died. To give you an example of one of them, somebody poisoned a salad bar in a restaurant in Oregon with salmonella, and a couple of people got sick. That's hardly the kind of food terrorism that threatens our food system. We have two million farms in this country producing food every day. There's a vast network spread over 3,000 miles of food production. It would be very difficult for a terrorist organization, even if it were incredibly well organized, to take down that system. What is actually happening here is something different. Will Potter has written a great book on this, in which, he, uh, which is called Green is the New Red. What Will Potter says is that just as the communist scare in the 50s was designed to um, draw attention to people's behavior if they were asserted to, if they were alleged to have communist affiliation, the green scare that we're living in today is designed to stifle activism among environmental and animal activists by branding them with a terrorist label. It's a very difficult label to overcome. This, these laws, which are also based on a model ALEC statute called the Animal and Ecological Terrorism Act, mean that if you're engaged in relatively innocuous civil disobedience or uh, exercising free speech rights, you can be charged as a terrorist in this country. It's unbelievable. It's a very powerful weapon that animal food producers have in their arsenal to use to protect their their sales and their profits. Let's talk about customary farming exemptions. For me, this is really the most important issue. It's really why I wrote the book, and I think for many people who have turned to a plant-based diet, this is one of the main reasons behind their decision to do that. What are customary farming exemptions? These are exemptions that take a state's broad cruelty statute that prohibits cruelty to animals, and they carve out a small exemption for farm animals. And they say that the statute doesn't apply to farm animals. I want to give you an example of how this works. In Connecticut, in 1854, the legislature passed a very broad cruelty statute. It prohibited cruelty to any animal. You can't get any broader than that. And that's great. That statute was on the books for almost 150 years. In 1996, the Connecticut legislature adopted a customary farming exemption. I have this text memorized. But if I don't read it, you won't believe me. So I'm going to have to read it to you, OK? This is what the Connecticut legislature, this is what the Connecticut anti-cruelty statute says today. In Connecticut, 
it is legal to, quote, maliciously and intentionally maim, mutilate, torture, wound, or kill an animal, provided the act is done while following generally accepted agricultural practices, unquote. To paraphrase, it is legal to intentionally torture a farm animal. The, the, the second part of that statutory language, if it's done in accordance with generally accepted agricultural practices, here's what that means. If a group of farmers suddenly decides that they want to start cutting off a new part of an animal's body, with or without anesthetic, although invariably without, and there is an expedient or economic reason to do it, and enough of them start doing it, ear, legs, beak, tail, genitals, whatever, by definition, because a number of them are doing it, it becomes legal. It used to be illegal, and then a bunch of them started doing it, and they made it legal. That is how these statutes work. We have these statutes in 37 states. In the 13 states that don't have them, the same principle of law applies by virtue of judicial decision-making or the common law. This practice essentially removes from state legislatures the authority to decide what constitutes animal cruelty, and it hands it to the animal food producers who are raising these animals. It says, yeah, you decide. If you think it's not cruel, well, we're, we're okay with that. This isn't really any different, in my view, from letting nursing home operators decide what constitutes elder abuse. It's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. What am I talking about when I talk about customary farming exemptions? The picture tells a thousand words. Starting at the top left, it's legal in every state in this country to chop off virtually any part of an animal's body without anesthetic. Tail, ears, beak, genitals. Genitals can be either chopped off or crushed without anesthetic. Now, incidentally, it would cost about 25 cents to anesthetize an animal before castrating him. It doesn't seem like much money. I mean, you just pull out a quarter and pay it. But if you have 100,000 animals, that's $25,000. That's a lot of money. If you have a million animals, that's $250,000. So you can see that it adds up. Nobody's going to do something that the rest of the industry isn't required to do because that's going to make them uncompetitive. Then they can't compete. They have to sell their products for more, and they're going, to, they're going to be outcompeted by the people who didn't spend the money on the anesthetic. So you can understand why nobody will voluntarily do something that they're not required to do in this industry. Top middle, in virtually every, in almost every state in the country, it's legal to confine sows in gestation crates. These are pregnant pigs who will spend the majority of their lives um, in, in a state of confinement where they can, um, basically can't move. A few states have actually outlawed this practice. Florida is one. California, where I'm from, is another one. Um, Florida and California are not leading pork-producing states, so while it's nice, it doesn't really affect the fact that 95, more than 95% of the pork raised in this country continues to come from animals raised like this. In almost every state in the country, it's legal to raise hens in battery cages, this means that a typical hen will spend her life in an area about two-thirds the size of a piece of paper, about like that. Um, this practice has also been outlawed in a few states, including California. Again, California, not a major egg-producing state. So more than 95% of the eggs raised uh, in this country continue to come from battery hens. Now, when I talk about customary farming exemptions, people often respond by saying, that sounds terrible, but in my case, I get all of my fill-in-the-blank from fill-in-the-blank. So this, this isn't going on with my food. Fill-in-the-blank. I get all of my, um, all of my pork is organic. All of my eggs are cage-free. All of my beef, beef is grass-fed. It doesn't matter. 98 to 99% of all of the animal foods consumed in this country come from factory farms. We know this, statistically. These bottom three slides are images of cage-free hen production. Bottom left, it's about 100,000 hens in a dark, windowless shed where they'll spend their entire lives. They'll be de-beaked, as you see in the bottom right, which means 
They'll have a third to half of their beak removed. It's a painful procedure. It leaves them in chronic pain with a, with a stump neuroma or a fibrotic nerve ending. Because they use their beak to eat, every time they eat for the rest of their life, it will hurt. And of course, male chicks don't lay eggs, so they're totally useless and irrelevant in this industry. And as the bottom middle slide shows, they can be disposed of in any way that is convenient and expedient. They could be dumped into garbage cans and left to starve or freeze to death. They can be thrown in wood chippers or meat grinders. Farmers don't engage in these behaviors because they want to be cruel. Nobody really sets out and says, I'm going to see how cruel I can be. What is going on is economic pressures force people to do this stuff. A, a chicken is only worth about $3. That's the replacement value of a chicken. If you're a farmer and your chicken has a prolapsed uterus, you're not going to call a vet and spend $30, $40, $50 to treat that condition. You're going to pick that chicken up and throw her in the garbage. It's not cruel. It sounds cruel to us, but it's not intentionally cruel. That is economic reality. The only way to change producer behavior is to change the way the law applies to them. Now, when states fail to act to protect the disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, the challenged, often the federal government steps in. Because here we're talking about state laws, you might think, well, maybe the federal government has nobly come to the rescue of farm animals. The federal government has introduced a lot of, uh, is responsible for a lot of great laws over the years, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, etc. Unfortunately, the federal government has not done much in this area. The most important federal statute, as far as animals are concerned, is the Animal Welfare Act, which specifically does not apply to animals raised for food. So we can ignore it. There's something called the 28-hour law. This law says that when animals are being transported across state lines, if the trip takes more than 28 hours, the driver has to stop, offload the animals, and give them a chance to rest and to have food and water. First of all, if that sounds humane to you, ask yourself this question. How many times in your life have you been denied food, water, and rest for 28 hours? Probably never. More importantly, this law has so many exceptions and loopholes that is, that is, practically speaking, completely ineffective. First of all, it doesn't apply to chickens or turkeys, which constitute roughly 98% of the animals raised for food in this country. It doesn't apply to intrastate trips. You have to cross the state line. If you just travel the length of Florida or California or Texas, even though you drive for several days, this law doesn't apply. The maximum penalty is $650. A slap on the wrist. It doesn't apply if the driver can show that he couldn't avoid violating the law, quote, when being careful. That is actually what the statute says. If the driver can just say, look, I was being careful, and I couldn't avoid violating the law, the law doesn't apply. Because of all these crazy loopholes, an animal rights group was interested a few years ago to know whether this law is actually enforced at all. They presented a, a request under the Freedom of Information Act to the USDA and the United States Department of Justice, and they asked, in the last 50 years, have you enforced or attempted to enforce the 28-hour law? And in both cases, USDA and USDOJ, the answer is no. This law is never enforced. Completely irrelevant. And here's the final um, gem in the, um, in the federal legislation category. The Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. This act says that before an animal is slaughtered, he or she must be rendered insensible to pain. That means stunned. In, uh, in this photo, that's a bolt gun, stunning that animal. Again, lots of exceptions. It doesn't apply to chickens or turkeys, which again constitute 98% of the animals raised for food in this country. Turkeys and chickens are routinely killed by just having their throats slit and being left to bleed out. This statute also doesn't apply at all 
during an animal's lifetime. It applies only in the final instant of the animal's life, only the, the last few seconds when the animal is about to be killed. So the, the state and federal protections for farm animals are so completely insufficient that a couple of lawyers who wrote about this a few years ago, David Wolfson and Marianne Sullivan, um, you may know Marianne as the New York lawyer who is co-host of the Our Hen House podcast, they said, farm animals have no legal protection at all. As far as the law is concerned, they simply do not exist. Now, as I said at the beginning, these legal protections for animal food producers are a valuable cocoon of protection. These laws allow producers to offload their costs on a society. And here's what I'm talking about. If I take my garbage to the front of my driveway and I leave it there for the garbage service to pick up and I pay them to pick it up, I internalize my costs of garbage collection. That is to say, I created the garbage, I pay to have it picked up, that's appropriate. On the other hand, if I drive to a park and I dump my garbage there, I externalize my garbage collection costs, which is to say I impose those costs on somebody else, taxpayers, society, the operator of this park, whoever. I argue that metaphorically speaking, animal food producers are dumping their garbage in our parks because they are offloading the vast majority of their production costs onto society. Let's look at what some of those costs are. I'll show you a few slides with a few different categories, and at the end I'll show you a total, and you'll get, you'll get sort of the full picture. This is just the U.S. costs associated with these practices. Fishing leads to externalized costs of about $4.5 billion. That bycatch figure of $2.4 billion, this is what that means. When commercial fisheries are engaged in uh, looking for a particular species, like shrimp, they routinely catch in, tr in trawl nets or long lines many non-target species. Shrimp, shrimp fishing is actually particularly egregious in this respect. One study shows that for every one pound of shrimp caught, there are 10 pounds of non-target species caught. And these include things like sea turtles, dolphins, porpoises, birds, albatross, threatened species, sea lions, seals. Every day on this planet, 200 million pounds of animals is thrown away as bycatch. That is 40% of the total catch. That is a huge figure. And it has a, a value that can be determined economically. In the U.S. alone, the value of that is uh, $2.4 billion. A few years ago, a couple of agricultural economists did a great study in which they ran a live auction. People had the opportunity in this auction to pull out their own wallets, open them up, and actually spend their own money to bid on moving animals from inhumane conditions to humane conditions. So they could move a pig from a gestation crate to a pasture. They could move egg-laying hens from a battery cage to a cage-free environment. Based on that data from that auction, which is a particularly good way to do it because you actually force people to, to use their own money rather than just give them a survey saying, how much would you pay? Usually those surveys don't, don't yield accurate results, but when people spend their own money, the results are good. Based on that data, Americans are likely to be willing to pay over $20 billion per year to end the cruelest practices in factory farming. This slide shows dairy cows in what's called a zero grazing environment. Today, a majority of dairy cows are raised in zero grazing environments. These are environments where, just as it sounds, the animals never go outside. They never graze. They live in a concrete and steel enclosure. Because they get no exercise and because they spend a lot of time standing in their own waste, 100% of dairy cows will, are expected to develop lameness during their life. That is, they can't walk. It's painful. Many will develop other conditions like mastitis, which is an inflamed udder. Environmental 
costs associated with animal food production. Total about $37 billion. And uh, as you can see from the slices of pie, these are things like costs associated with manure remediation. Um, that soil erosion figure, $15 billion. If anybody saw David Montgomery's talk yesterday about the importance of soil in this country, you know that we are damaging our soil. The United Nations says 55% of soil erosion in the United States is directly attributable to animal agriculture. So this $15 billion figure represents the portion of the total erosion costs associated with all agriculture, and it's just the, the animal portion. All of these are just the portion of the total cost that is associated with raising animals for consumption. Subsidies are about $38 billion in this country. This is a larger number than you might be used to seeing. The reason the number I use is relatively large is I include subsidies to corn and soybeans. In this country, 80% of the corn that we raise and 70% of the soybeans are fed to animals as feed. Those crops are heavily subsidized. You can't calculate subsidies to animal food producers without including subsidies to corn and soybeans. And as you can see, the typical cost to raise a pig is, a, is almost $9 more than that animal's market value. The typical cost to raise a cow is about $40 more than that market value. That difference is made up through subsidies. By far the largest component of externalized costs associated with animal food production is the healthcare costs. And again, these are only the portion of costs that are associated with consuming animal foods. That heart disease figure at the bottom, $143 billion, the total is three times that. This is just the cost associated with consuming a diet that is high in animal foods. So this is what, the, if you add up all of these components and categories, what the total looks like. It's about $414 billion. That is what animal food production costs in terms of externalized costs in this country every year. To put that number in perspective, it's about half of what we spend on Social Security each year. It's about one quarter of Canada's gross domestic product. It's a large number. Here's another perspective on that number. That yellow bar is the annual retail sales of animal food. That's about $251 billion. The blue bar in the middle is externalized costs, and the green is the total when you add sales to costs. And what that does is it yields this formula at the bottom. For every $1 of animal foods sold at retail, another $1.70 of externalized costs is imposed on consumers and taxpayers. So, every time McDonald's sells a Big Mac for $5, another $8 in costs is imposed on consumers and taxpayers, us. Whether you eat Big Macs or not, somebody's buying a Big Mac right now, and we're all paying part of it. The true cost of a Big Mac isn't really $5, it's really $13. However, because McDonald's doesn't charge $13 for their products and none of the other retailers selling animal foods charge the full cost of their products, those products have artificially low prices. Over the last 80 years in this country, as a result of widespread externalization of costs, the prices of animal foods have fallen across the board on an inflation-adjusted basis. Butter is down 44%, ham is down 48%, Chicken is down 70%. The law of demand is a really simple economic principle, and it says when prices come down, demand goes up. When prices go up, demand comes down. And we've all seen this happen in our day-to-day -day lives. When something's cheap, you buy more. When something's expensive, you buy less. Um, this slide shows an example of this in practice with respect to chicken consumption. And as you can see, in 1935, Americans consumed about nine pounds per person of chicken. And today we consume about 57 pounds of chicken per person. This graph is completely unrelated to population growth. This is just per capita consumption. It's nothing to do with the fact that our population has increased. At the same time, in 1935, top left, the price of chicken was $5 a pound and is now about $1.54 a pound. In other words, the price of chicken has fallen dramatically 
in 80 years, consumption of chicken has risen dramatically in 80 years, just as the law of demand predicts. It's not, not rocket science. Recently, in the last couple of years, if you could expand the, the right edges of this and blow it up a little bit, you'd actually see prices have ticked up a little bit. There's been a drought in the West and Midwest that has caused feed crop prices to go up a little, and as a result, chicken prices have gone up a little. At the same time, consumption has come down a little bit, just as the law of demand predicts. I think that when prices stabilize, consumption will continue to, prices will go down further, consumption will continue to go up. Now, let me summarize to this point. Animal food producers externalize the vast majority of their costs and impose those costs on a society. As a result of that heavy externalization of costs, they're able to lower the retail prices that they charge for their goods. Those low retail prices that are artificially low mean that consumers buy much, much more of those goods than they would otherwise. As I said earlier, Americans have roughly doubled our meat consumption in the last 80 years. During this same period, we've gone from 100 pounds per person to just under 200 pounds per person. One in three is obese, two in three is overweight. We have problems that are associated with these very high levels of consumption. It's not just health. There are environmental issues as well. I'll just give you a few data points. One in three groundwater sources in U.S. states in this country is contaminated with animal waste. More than 30,000 miles of rivers, lakes, and, uh, and other, uh, I'm sorry, of rivers and streams is contaminated with animal waste. One third of the world's fisheries, commercial fisheries, have collapsed. That is, they no longer produce fish. Scientists think that by, two, by 2050, the middle of the century, all of the commercial fisheries will have collapsed by virtue of over, because of overfishing. Two acres of rainforest is destroyed every minute to provide land to grow crops, to feed beef cattle, or to provide land to graze beef cattle. Americans are near the top of the planet in terms of per capita meat consumption, but the rest of the planet is catching up. And when they do, the planet will be short about two-thirds as much, again, as much land as we need to, to grow the crops to feed those animals. The land doesn't exist. It's just not there, period. So... Let me look at some of the sustainability issues that meat and dairy present. Compared to plant-based protein, as you can see from these bar charts, animal, um, producing animal protein takes about five times the land, 11 times the fossil fuels, and um, 40 times the water. Just looking at water, I live in California. As you may know, we've been in the middle of a multi-year drought. I just downloaded this um, image a couple days ago. I don't know if you can read the fine print, but in the very bottom right, there's a little yellow area. That is the only area in California that is not in the middle of a drought right now. That area is abnormally dry. All the other colors from beige to dark red represent moderate drought, severe drought, extreme drought, or exceptional drought. California is short something like 40 trillion gallons of water every year, which is a lot of water. One way to think about California's situation is to compare it to, to something. So let me just give you a little comparison here. Lake Powell is the largest reservoir in the country, measured in terms of capacity. Lake Powell is only at about 40% of its capacity because of multi-year drought in California and other western states. Lake Powell is, is a lake formed by a dam in the Colorado River. It's on the Utah and Arizona border. So it's at 40% of its capacity. It's down about 5 trillion gallons of water, which is a lot of water. Coincidentally, California, one of the nation's leading dairy-producing states, uses about 5 trillion five trillion gallons of water each year to produce dairy. Now, I'm not saying that if California stopped producing dairy, Lake Powell's 
level would rise. I'm just saying it's interesting to conceptualize this huge block of missing water with the water that is used over here to produce dairy. I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Cowspiracy, but there's a short and really interesting interview with a, dairy, a California dairy producer that I thought I would play, if I can get it to play here. It requires a, a lot of inputs to produce milk. The feed, the water, the land, um, it does. And it, it may not be practical to expect that there can be enough dairy production produced in a sustainable way to, to feed the entire world. I just don't think that um, that's necessarily a given. I think it's maybe too, too much to expect that the world can be fed with dairy um, in a sustainable way. It's really too much to expect that the world could be fed with dairy in a sustainable way. That is a dairy producer talking. You've got to admire his candor. So there's a major sustainability issue with animal agriculture. It, it, it just cannot continue at this level. People consume too much. Our population is growing and at the same time we're consuming more and more. Commentators have proposed a number of solutions to this sustainability problem. Those solutions include things like organic farming, local farming, pasture farming, ecological rotation. In my book, Meatonomics, I discuss each of these solutions and I show mathematically why they cannot work at our current levels of consumption. If we dial back that consumption dramatically, say back to where it was in 1950, yes, Animals could be raised in pasture. Animals could be raised um, locally. But today, given our, con our high levels of consumption in this country, the only way to meet that demand is to raise animals in factory farms. Let me just give you one example of what I'm talking about. Some of you may have heard of Polyface Farm. It's a well-known eco-rotation farm in Virginia that is profiled in the book Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. At Polyface, the cattle move around the farm. The chickens follow the cattle a few days later and they, they peck insects from the manure. And the rabbits follow them in cages. And the whole thing is thought to be about as sustainable as animal agriculture can be. Here's the thing. There are something like 313 million Americans and we consume something like just under 200 pounds of meat per person per year. So the question is, how much of that meat is polyface, for example, producing? How many people per year does polyface feed? You might guess 100,000, 90,000, 80,000 people. Polyface farm feeds, uh, produces enough meat to feed about 700 people each year. That's almost nothing. It makes me wonder why we even talk about it. In some fantasy land or on some other planet where there's unlimited amounts of land, operations like polyface might work. But on this planet and in this country where all the land is being used for something today, polyface doesn't work as a model. To give you an example, in Southern California where I live, if we wanted to produce all of our meat using the polyface model, you would need 33,000 more farms. They would, that land would take up seven of the eight counties in Southern California. No room for houses, no room for buildings, freeways, nothing. Just farming. So this model doesn't work sustainably at our current consumption levels. If, if Americans can be convinced to dial back their consumption dramatically, farms like Polyface might work, and they could, and they would actually be much better for the environment. Now, there's still going to be ethical issues. Polyface still slits the throats of its chickens while they're awake and alert, and there are issues like that. But if consumption were lower, there are some things that could be done sustainably. Look at another example. Local farming is, is all the rage right now, and it's a good idea. I think that when possible, we should buy locally. However, it's definitely not a silver bullet. As this graph shows, when we measure food's carbon footprint, we look at what's called a life cycle assessment, or an LCA. The local component of, of a food 
is only about 11% of its LCA. That's that transportation figure on the top left. But processing, preparation, and production together account for about 70%. So any in inefficiency in processing, preparation, or production is going to completely outweigh the benefit of food having been raised locally. And you can see a great example of that here in this study, which recently asked the question, is it more environmentally friendly for the British to buy their lamb locally or to import it from New Zealand? In Britain, lamb production is very fossil fuel intensive. In New Zealand, lamb production relies on alternative fuels like solar, wind, and geothermal. As a result, it is much more environmentally friendly for Brits to import their lamb from New Zealand. It's counterintuitive, but it's four times more environmentally friendly, both in terms of energy consumed, even after you account for the, tr the, the energy costs associated with transportation, and in carbon output. The point is not that local farming isn't a good idea. I think it is. The point is that in each instance, the math can be complicated. And local farming is not going to be a silver bullet for animal agriculture any more than eco-rotation operations like polyphase are. So I said I was going to talk about how producers influence us, and I did. I said I was going to talk about some of the economic consequences, and I did. I said I would talk about the sustainability issues, and I did. I said I would talk about some solutions. So now let me talk about the solutions. In this country, we tax tobacco products an average of about 70%. So the typical $5 pack of cigarettes has about a 350 tax tacked onto it, so it ends up costing 850. Just as the law of demand predicts, as you raise the price of cigarettes by taxing cigarettes, you lower consumption. About 100 years ago, uh, an economist named Arthur Pigou, who taught at Cambridge, proposed that it makes a lot of sense to tax undesirable goods like liquor, tobacco, gasoline, because when you tax them, you reduce consumption, and you also provide a new revenue stream for the government that is imposing the tax. There is a so-called uh, double dividend from these taxes. They're called Pigovian taxes, named after Pigou, who, who proposed that they would work. And they work really well. I want to just show you a couple of graphs that show how they've worked for cigarettes. As you can see in this graph, the, the red line at the bottom left, in 1982, cigarettes cost $1.88 per pack. As a result of taxes being imposed over the next few decades, um, a few years ago they cost $4.64 a pack. And during the same time, you can see that green line shows that consumption declined from, in this country, 32 billion packs per year to 17 billion packs per year. That is the law of demand at work, just like that chicken slide. Here's another interesting graph for tobacco. During that same period, 82 to 2007, as, toba as tobacco taxes were increased by state and federal governments, revenues went from $15 billion to $25 billion. And during the same time, the incidence of lung cancer in this country went from 145 cases per 100,000 Americans, dropped down to 100 cases per 100,000 Americans. It's really working. It's, it's making Americans healthier, it's reducing consumption of tobacco products, and it's increasing revenues for state and federal uh, government entities that are imposing these taxes. So, uh, as you might guess, I suggest that one of the best ways that we can reduce consumption of animal foods in this country is to tax them. I propose a 50% tax on all foods that contain any animal products. So a $5 Big Mac would have a $2.50 tax on it. It would cost $7.50. And as predicted, the law of demand says people will buy fewer Big Macs. Now, the idea is not to make people struggle to meet their food budget. So at the same time, I also propose providing a $500 tax credit annually, which would offset the extra costs associated with the tax. So what would happen is, in a typical year, People would spend a little more on meat, but they would also shift some of their buying to plant-based foods, 
And at the end of the year, the extra that they've spent would be reimbursed through this tax credit. If, if and when a 50% tax is imposed in this country, and I do think we will tax meat at some point. 50% is kind of high, but I think, I think we'll start taxing meat at some point in my lifetime. That tax, plus some other institutional changes that I recommend, like eliminating checkoff programs, eliminating subsidies, would have the effect of reducing consumption of animal foods by about 44% in this country. That would take us back to where we were in 1950, roughly, when obesity, the rate of obesity was not one in three, it was one in eight. There would be a lot of benefits from reducing consumption that dramatically. For example, we could save 170,000 human lives every year. We could save 26 billion land and marine animals' lives every year. We could return to its native habitat something like 600,000 square miles of land that would no longer be needed to raise animals or the feed crops necessary to feed them. That's like twice the size of Texas. Perhaps most importantly, we would avoid emitting about three trillion pounds of carbon equivalent emissions every year that this tax is in effect, that would have roughly the same effect as garaging all motor vehicles and motor vessels in this country. So that's one thing we can do. That's the, that's the institutional change that would make sense. But there's also the possibility of change on an individual level. And that is to say that you can make a decision to eat less animal products or to give them up completely. And as the speakers this, this week have been saying repeatedly, our bodies don't need animal products and they're generally much better off without them. As, as this chart shows, um, a vegan has uh, about 25% lower cholesterol than an omnivore, about 18% lower body mass index, and perhaps most importantly, this purple bar at the, at the right suggests that there is a choice. You can, you can eat meat and live to be 87, or you can go vegan and live to 100. That's more or less what this, what this uh, longevity figure suggests possibly adjusted based on your own personal um, life expectancy, but that is a major difference. But it doesn't stop there. Because the other question is, how do you want to live the last few years of your life? I, I'm general counsel at a healthcare company, and we supply products to patients who are in long-term care facilities or nursing homes. These are mostly elderly patients in their 70s, 80s, 90s, sometimes 100 or more. Um, these are mostly patients who have a lot of things wrong with them, clinically referred to as comorbidities. Now, just before I got on my plane, I printed a bunch of papers related to these patients. Now, when somebody checks into a nursing home, the administrator fills out what's called a face sheet or cover sheet. It's just a single page with all the data about the person, their name and address, their contact, their next of kin. And, and importantly, for legal purposes, it lists all of their comorbidities. Why do the nursing homes do that? Because they don't want to be sued if somebody um, came in with a condition and later argues that it was the nursing home's negligence that gave them that condition. So if somebody's got a pressure ulcer on their sacrum, you can be darn sure that's going to be listed on the cover sheet so the nursing home doesn't acu get, get accused of causing that person to develop that pressure ulcer or, or bed sore. Now, I chose these completely at random. I chose eight cover sheets, and then later when I looked at them, I saw that a bunch of them were illegible, they were handwritten, or they had a lot of abbreviations, so I couldn't read them. So I just pulled out the three that, that were typed and were legible and didn't have abbreviations. And I, I just want to read you a couple of these because when you hear all of the comorbidities that these people have, and these are not 100-year-old people, these are like 70, early 80-year-old people, you will be astonished. Many of these diseases are directly or indirectly related to consuming animal foods. And you've heard them mentioned over the last eight, nine days at this conference. So here's one typical patient in a nursing home. This is a nursing home in New York. 
This person has gastrointestinal hemorrhage, anemia, urinary tract infection, E. coli septicemia, diabetes, that's half, hypertension, senile dementia, congestive heart failure, esophageal reflux disease. That's, none of these is really a contagious disease. These are, these are diseases of indulgence. These relate to, to diet, possibly lack of exercise, and other things. Here's another example. This is from a nursing home in New Hampshire. This person has diverticulitis of colon, effects of chillblains, diabetes, other acquired absence of organ, unspecified hemorrhage of gastrointestinal tract, edema, dementia, glaucoma, cramp of limb, unspecified peripheral vascular disease, anxiety state, colostomy, vascular insufficiency of intestine, depressive disorder, anemia, closed fracture of pubis, I'm almost done. It, it, it would be funny if it weren't a real person who's, who's in pain and suffering. Restless leg syndrome and, uh, and a pacemaker. Many, but not all, of those comorbidities are directly related to consuming animal foods. So the question is, not just do you care about the environment, do you care about animals, and hopefully the answer is yes, but the question is, how do you want to live your life, and how do you want to spend the last two, three, four, five years of your life? Do you want to be sitting in a nursing home with somebody changing your diaper and turning you and putting bandages on your bed sores? Or do you want to be you know, hiking, playing golf, and doing the things that, that people are supposed to be doing when they're retired and supposedly enjoying their lives? So we've um, come back full circle to Aldous Huxley. He's a guy who wrote Brave New World, the book I talked about early on. Huxley died in 1963, coincidentally the same year I was born. Now, I know what you're thinking. I don't look that old. Thank you. Some people have suggested that I might be Huxley's reincarnation. I, I don't know that. I cannot confirm or deny. But I want to leave you with a quote from Huxley. Huxley said, facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. During the slightly more than one hour that I've been talking, more than a million land animals have been killed for food in this country. We know that statistically, 98 to 99 percent of them lived and died in factory farms, subject to those customary farming exemptions that we saw a few slides ago. Virtually all of these animals lived in misery and suffering and died violent deaths. The facts of how those animals lived and died don't cease to exist for those animals and for each new generation that's introduced every few months simply because we choose to ignore them, forget them, or deny them. Those facts are always there for those animals. Huxley warned us that our government would try to manipulate us to get us to buy things that we don't want or need. And guess what? He was completely right. Let's heed Huxley's warning. Let's think for ourselves about what's for dinner, rather than let the federal government tell us that it's beef. And if you're not already doing so, I strongly encourage you to consider exercising one of the most powerful rights that you have as a consumer, and that is to boycott this cruel and dysfunctional industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will mention that there are just a few books uh, available if anybody's interested. I think, I think you will find this stuff really, really interesting. And I go into much more detail, obviously, in the book. I explore each of the categories and all the costs and 700 endnotes. I spent three years researching this book. And it can be yours for one low payment. Yes, questions? Hi, great, great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, regarding the nursing home, it got me thinking, is there or could there be a nursing home that checks you in and says, welcome to our vegan nursing home? 
Boy. where you will eat a plants only living food diet and not only that you're going to have to move your body around to the best of your ability and it seems to me that 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 dead people don't buy things or don't buy services so this would seem to me would be good for business yeah i think it's a great idea in fact I'm, sh I'm sure that if, if such a thing doesn't exist, that it will soon. In fact, I've heard of retirement communities that have been formed. Essentially, it's an intentional community formed around a principle. In some cases, um, it's people of a particular religion. In some cases, it's people of particular dietary beliefs. Um, I hope there's a good vegan retirement community I can check myself into when I'm ready. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Thanks.